My guest today is Dr. Jeremy Koenig, founder and CEO of Athletogen Technologies, a leader in providing precision performance insights to athletes and coaches by blending environmental data and genomics. Dr. Koenig's development of IRIS, a sports performance application, builds on his understanding of the valid role of genetic research that aims to enhance understanding of athlete susceptibility to injury, training, and recovery. Dr. Koenig was a varsity track and field athlete during his completion of his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, and following graduate school, he pursued postdoctoral training in genetics at Cornell University. He was then a professor of nutrigenomics at Mount St. Vincent University before moving to the biomedical industry. With more than 10 years of experience coaching professional athletes, Dr. Koenig combined his background in genomics and his passion for training when he founded Athletogen in 2014. Three years later, Athletogen is working with Olympians, Paralympians, and elite athletes and coaches. Dr. Koenig continues to combine his passion for sports performance with his formal training in genetics to accelerate scientific discovery through the delivery and application of genomics to every human. Jeremy, thanks so much for taking the time out today. Wow. Thank, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Bubs. It's an um, honor and pleasure. I love, I love what you guys are doing. I follow you on social. I actually listened to your uh, podcast last week with... Um, you know, microbi- microbiome or microbiota, proper nomenclature. Let's make sure we honor the speaker. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, Dr. Tony um, Wood, good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, it, it's like I said, um, humble to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I mean, obviously, really impressive uh, background. Can you tell folks a little bit about how you got into this, you know, sport and performance and genomics world, how it all came together for you? Sure, but it's not going to be, you know, uh, glamorous. I mean, I, I think it's. Um, you know, probably, uh, gosh, um, three or two parts hard work and one part luck. Um, and, uh, I think of course, um, all through it is, is, um, you know, having, having some kind of guiding star and feeling, um, uh, towards trying to, trying to do good. And, 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 um, uh, I think, uh, ultimately the legacy is, is always about, um, uh, as a New Zealand all blacks say is leave the Jersey in a better place. Right. Um, awesome. Yeah, but but I mean, I can get into some particulars. I, I um, you know, I think it's important to reconcile the fact that uh, you know, yes, we're certainly focused on high performers and 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 athletes. And um, but you know, a, a kind of running joke that I uh, have with people that I talk to is like, hey, you know, a- athletes are people too. <laughs> and I think I think actually Nike says it best: if you if you have a body, you're an athlete. Um, I think um, my affinity for sport performance, um, it really comes from, uh, it, it, sport was really something that I used as, um, you know, therapy, um, if you will, uh, growing up. I mean, uh, at a young age, my mom was, was diagnosed with, um, you know, multiple sclerosis and, um, you know, I, I left home at, at a young age and, and um, it was really actually the sport of boxing that kind of got me back on, on track. and. Um, you know, back back in school, effectively. But um, you know, I, I was a bit of a mama's boy and always wanted to, you know, help mom. And you know, like I said, she diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and so you know, here I was, this 15 year old kid, still just trying to save his mom. And you know, this was before email, so I'm like, sure. <laughs> you know, mailing professors and um, you know, running around talking about eicosanoid balance and anti-inflammatory diets and. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, her, um, her life didn't end well, I think in large part because of just lack of access to information. Um, but also because of an unnecessarily slow pace of research. And, you know, I felt this as, as an academic and, and, um, you know, I, I just see, uh, so much room to, uh, to improve and empower people. And, um, that's really through the technology that we're building. And, when we come back just, you know, full circle to talk about, hey, what is a performance? I mean, I think that it's where, you know, your, your innate ability or your, your nature, um, you know, how it's nurtured, where it's nurtured. And that interface, not, it's, you know, I think we've got a misnomer about, you know, nature versus nurture. I think it's how you nurture your nature or na- where nature meets nurture. And, and that's performance. And that's, that's life. So your performance could be a 958, 100 meter time, or, you know, it could be, living optimally into old age to be the best grandmother to your, your grandchildren. Um, so, you know, the how of, um, athletogen or, or, or how I got to where I am, I think, as I said, it was, you know, two parts, hard work, one part, uh, luck. And, and I think following a feeling that, um, you know, things, things can be better. 
and um, that's uh, I think in a broad sense as to the story and in, in, uh, leading me to, to where I am today. That's great. I mean, definitely myself as well in terms of clinical practice, working on the elite performance side, but then also with just regular folk who are trying to, you know, talk a lot about health span versus just lifespan. You know, people living a long life but having those last decades being, you know, in pain and discomfort and et cetera. So, um, you know, maybe before we dive into everything that Athletogen does, can you give everyone a quick, uh, you know, the docs, the nutritionists, the trainers, maybe a quick little review on the DNA side of things, take us back to uh, high school, university level, and then let's dive into what you guys do there at Athletogen. Uh, sure. I think back to, you know, high school um, genetics. And of course, you know, uh, doing doing my um, you know, PhD in molecular biology and postdocing in um, human genetics and actually human microbiome research as well. Um, I think the, the the challenge or the fallacy that you, you might get stuck into is one of despair where you're like, oh, my gosh, like, I feel like I'm really just asking more and more questions the more that I know. And that's what my um, honors uh, uh, supervisor, Dr. Melanie Dobson, actually first Rhodes Scholar, what she said to me, she's like, ah, now, now you're ready. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, asking, you're asking questions and you, and you know it's never ending. So full, full disclosure, disclaimer, I mean, what's written in the textbooks, as soon as it's there, we, we know it to be incomplete. But nevertheless, there are fundamentals um, that I think can can certainly serve as a starting point. And um, you know, if we're going to talk about genetics, uh, you know, people like to describe genetics as the blueprint for you know uh, everything in your body. And um, I think blueprint okay, um, it, it, it it serves um, to a certain extent, but um, it falls short when you uh, start to operate at a cellular level. So. You know, say, for example, you know, you have a blueprint of a building, you know, everything's going to be printed and uh, sorry, everything is going to be made and constructed and it's going to come together. And, you know, a human body is much more dynamic than that. And, um, you know, I, so I like to think of it more as a as a library. And um, within that library, you uh, have, you know, different, um, you know, books or books, let's say. So if the library is the cell, um, the books would be. Um, you know, I, I would even actually break it down into different rooms or subject matter, um, uh, different different areas of, of um, subjects. Um, so different rooms would be like you know your your chromosomes. So different you know major major topics, and then you know a, a plethora of um, you know volumes within those rooms, but they're all encoded by you know four letters: your A, G, C, T, and uh, effectively come together in an infinite number of, of combinations. Um, that lead to um, the expression of you know, proteins, enzymes, um, you know, even even RNA enzymes uh, that uh, effectively come together uh, through cellular differentiation and, and um, you know human development to uh, uh, bring hum- humankind into into a form, and it's a form that you know as I kind of, I, I concluded this to. Um, Explanation is one that's that's dynamic. So, uh, changing based on environmental stressors. So, you know things like um, gene ex- or environmental pressures, like even a change in diet, can uh, lead to a change in gene expression of different enzymes, for example. So, um, certainly not as static as high school textbooks would would lead, lead you to believe. Um, but certainly, it's a starting point to you know, understanding, you know, at our core, human beings, like, you know, what, what is our nature? And, um, if it, to the reductionists out there, you can say, yes, well, there's this four letter code, um, you know, that we could in theory define any aspect of, um, a, a, a human trait. Um, but the fun is how all these things come together. Absolutely. I mean, it's always amazing how we respond to the, our environment and, you know, the old adage of, you know, the genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Now, for you guys at Athletogen, I mean, in dividing things up into this idea of, you know, nutrition and response to training, injury recovery, sports psychology, you've, you know, you've grouped things in certain areas. Is that, uh, is that something that you guys came to organically? Did that evolve over time? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, um, a great question. I mean, I think, I think in large part um, it, it came through surveying the, the literature, right? Um, so these aren't necessarily categories that um, we defined up front a, a priori. It was, it was, hey, let's take a look at where uh, all the white papers are 
and um, you know, and then go from there. And you know, obviously, nutrition, nutrigenomics is a is a hot area of research, and um, you know, human human performance is is um, you know one that uh, is receiving a lot of interest nowadays. Uh, absolutely, but um, when you come to you know aspects of uh, human performance, obviously. You know the nutritional component plays plays into that as well, and uh, sports psychology um, also. Uh, so I think it works. Like chunking things like this, um, you know, helps people you know start to consume content. Yep. Um, but uh, the the real fun comes in uh, when you start looking at um, you know all these things in concert. For sure, yeah. I mean, it definitely even in functional medicine, this idea of kind of looking at all the patterns and the trends and, and where people are um, sitting, whether it's symptom-wise, lab testing-wise, to give us these general ideas. And I, I know that's a lot of what you guys do with in terms of the genetics. So can we talk about a few of the specifics around the genetic markers? I mean, um, you know, I know in nutrition, the CYP1A2, in terms of involving metabolism, caffeine metabolism, myself, I'm, a, I'm an AC, I'm a slow metabolizer. So, you know, can you give folks at home an idea of what does that mean for me and uh, – uh, or for someone on a performance side or even a health side? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting one that, um, and I'm glad you brought it up because I think so many of us can can relate to this. And, you know, I think um, maybe the best way to describe it to listeners is even even through my own experience. So when, when I was chatting to you just before we started, remember I said, you know, I went down to Altiz to train with, um, you know, a former training partner of mine in college. And He's always making coffee. He's like, hey, you want coffee? You want coffee? You want coffee? And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. You're having it. You're having it. And like by day three, I was like shaking so much I couldn't move. I was dehydrated. <laughs> I was just like wired. I was like a like a border collie, like just like what 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 what's next? Yeah. And he he was just like chill and relax and like drinking coffee before bed. And this is like oh my god. So really, what it has to do is uh, with the speed at which that you metabolize and and um, you know effectively uh, uh, eliminate caffeine from your system. And some people do that much more quickly than others. And um, you know, well, how does that impact people? Um, I mean, I can tell you how it impacts me. Like if I'm not careful, um, I can you know find myself consuming too much coffee, and 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 my mental acuity just is is blown away because I just can't focus. Um, I think, um, in terms of, uh, you know, performance and, and training, even anything with any kind of like skill component, um, you know, I find if uh, beyond a certain threshold of caffeine, I actually get diminishing returns and act, actually, uh, like harmful, um, uh, effect. And, um, you know, so this comes back to like behavior modification and, you know, again, we were talking before we started is, uh, you know, instead of like a shot of caffeine in the morning, I hop in the cold tub. Because you know that just gets my nervous system going, and I look for you know more kind of uh, natural um, you know supplements with uh, you know kind of a nootropic effect um, you know versus mega dosing on on caffeine. So um, you know how, how does that, uh, that that's how it affects me? But I mean, it, it's amazing how something seemingly so trivial can actually have such far-reaching effects. Like you know, an athlete, for example, if they're sensitive to caffeine and they're training at you know four or five o'clock at night. And they're, you know, stimulating their, you know, their 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 nervous system, you know, beyond all all get out and and, and um, trying to go to sleep after that. Um, sleep, I think sleep hygiene gets um, negatively affected, and you can find yourself in a you know, downward spir- spiral of, um, you know, overtraining because you're not recovering effectively. Uh, so yeah, that's just that's just one simple insight, you know, and. Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, we even for us, kind of the basketball. I mean, a lot of our guys playing games, obviously NBA games, are in the evening, and so, you know, like you mentioned, you can get some of those performance benefits. But for a lot of guys, uh, depending even on the size of the coffee they're having, you know, get into these venti six hundred milligrams at seven p.m. All of a sudden, uh, over the course of an eighty-two game season, we're going to get some, possibly some really diminishing returns. And I think, you know, a lot of people forget even that three milligrams per kilogram is kind of that magic uh, spot there. And folks who are just working hard. You know, downtown type A's, etc. I mean, I'm always amazed when somebody comes in and they're on their third or fourth cup by noon. Um, which, you know, again, if you have some information around some of these genes, then we got a better understanding of why. For some of us, we feel like we've got anxiety at that point, whereas other people are able to to kind of survive, right? More is better. That's the fallacy we find ourselves in all the time. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's not about more is better. It's like, how can you do more, if you will, uh, um, you know, research or, um, 
you know, learning, knowledge acquisition, um, and, and, and apply, you know, that information to, um, you know, your, your body. And it's not necessarily just, Oh, got a, you know, some minor boost in performance here in caffeine. Let's, let's go more and more and more. I mean, that's, it's a minimum effective dose. Um, I think is something that uh, we, we hear a lot about in the medical, um, field. Um, but it's, it's kind of creeping into even the performance realm. You know, you hear Dan Path use it over and over again, minimum, minimum, minimum effective dose. I mean, training is ultimately stress and, um, you know, we, we, uh, are coming off, I think a previous generation of this notion of no pain, no gain. And uh, like, sure. I mean, things are going to be hard and difficult, but not, they don't necessarily have to hurt, um, and, um, you know, pain isn't necessarily the indicator that uh, would suggest you're doing the right thing. Um, but, I mean, I think, like, I, I, I always love to go back to a St. Bolt um, as an example. If he just naturally ran 958 with no training, he probably wouldn't train. I mean, what's the point? Exactly. So, so if you can find – it's a careful balance between, hey, what's, what's the um, – what's the minimum amount of work I have to do to get the maximum benefit? And, you know, people, athletes especially, are always flirting with that line. Um, and a lot of them cross it, the injury line, um, just through a lack of understanding about their bodies. 100%. I mean, it's definitely people and athletes, type A's, fall back on that just more is better mentality because that's what they're good at. They can push themselves. So great uh, great comments on that. Now, on the injury prevention side, if we shift over, I mean, some genes as well that uh, – code for, for risk around, uh, you know, tendons, Achilles. Can you talk us through, uh, that at all? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, what I can do is I got a few slides on this. Actually, I can, I can post, um, to some of your listeners if they're, if they're interested, uh, cause we actually went through a use case, um, on this, um, you know, specifically Perfect. at, at, at Altis. And, um, you know, this is, this is really neat because, uh, well, you know, we followed, um, you know, a female uh, athlete over time, and and um, you know, it, it was kind of a more of a perspectival study, um, you know, case study in that way, where um, you know we looked at various aspects of um, you know, like hey, what what is what did this athlete present with before injury, for example? So biomechanical risk factors, so like asymmetrical loading, or this athlete was four foot dominant, pigeon toed. Um, and then there was always this kind of soreness. There was a manageable soreness, but a soreness nevertheless. Um, and specifically, uh, injury history was, again, an Achilles um, tendonitis slash soreness that was revealed, um, you know, after this athlete came off of a very, very high training load, um, you know, ran a PB the week before and then actually ruptured her Achilles tendon. Um, so the interesting thing is, you know, we went, we went back and, um, you know, took a look at, um, the genetic aspect of, um, this athlete's predisposition. And, and you'll notice that I, I prefaced, um, this whole, um, explanation, you know, with the environmental factors ahead of time, right? Because this is, this is the context that needs to be added, um, you know, to, to, um, you know, any, any DNA information. Uh, and so it wasn't just, you know, the call, uh, five, a one gene that's responsible for, um, you know, the synthesis of, um, collagen tendinous ligament collagen. Um, and that a variant of that, um, tends to be a, um, you know, uh, correlated with individuals with, um, you know, a higher in or populations with a higher incidence of Achilles tendon rupture. Um, but you know, there, there are other factors as well, other genetic factors like call one, a one, and there's the cas P eight and MMP three. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll put this slide out to your listeners if they're interested, because I, Perfect. I'm, yeah, this is show notes I'm for sure. more visual, all these like <laughs> cryptic codes out there. I'll, I'll, I'll put this, put this out. But, um, yeah, the, the athlete that, um, you know, presented with this, uh, um, uh, predisposition towards injury and all of those environmental signals, um, did in fact rupture her Achilles tendon. And then, you know, what's interesting, you know, just our own, um, you know, research and working with Altis, we, we look at, for an example, uh, an elite track and field population. And, uh, what we see is the protective allele of the call five, um, a one marker, the one that you, you asked, the uh, protective variant there um, is actually 
present in 48%. So that's homozygous, so both versions of the protective allele. That's present in 48%. If we compare that to the general population, it's only 11%. Wow. wow. So, yeah, I mean, pretty striking. So it's like, you know, a lot of your longevity in your career has a lot to do with, you know, in a, in a sense, um, your uh, predisposed risk to injury. Now, and it's not to say that, okay, well, folks, um, you know, with, with the vulnerability can't necessarily be in the track and field organization. Well, because if I look at, you know, folks that are, have both, um, you know, uh, copies of the, of the allele that would predispose them to rupture, there's still 15% of them. And there's 37% that are, that are home are heterozygous. So have one protective version and, and, and one not. The opportunity here is, um, you know, if we're talking about longevity, we're talking about preserving the careers of these individuals, uh, is, is um, you know, paying particular attention to things like training load and soreness, uh, injury history to, to those people that are um, potentially at a, at a higher risk as indicated by their genetics. And, you know, when we just ask the folks at Alta, it's like, hey, well, who's on the table all the time? Yeah. It's like, well, lo and behold, um, you know, these are these are folks that are that are likely to have the, the predisposition. So we can get ahead of the injury. We can we can um, we can extend a uh, player or an athlete's career uh, just by giving them information in in a um, in a responsible way. And we've actually seen this. I believe there was a um, a study that was published a, a, a group out of um, you know Stanford University um, and. Um, they effectively found uh, that in communicating with triathletes, their injury vulnerability, I think they, they saw a decline uh, in injury with those people by 70% compared to a control population or something like that. Just basically wow. showing that just by through communication of information, um, you're, you're going to have a, uh, a more informed training plan and ultimately um, avoid, avoid injury. Yeah, I mean, that's... Um it's compelling stuff, especially even for us in terms of Canada basketball or myself with basketball players as well as jumping sports, this idea of you know, injury prevention, especially as it relates to Achilles, et cetera, is so key. And even as a gateway even for a lot of the nutrition changes because when people start to see that there is some potential there, then all of a sudden um, that buy-in and being able to build some of those habits uh, gets to be a little bit, a little bit easier. Do you guys notice that a little bit with uh, down at Altus or with some of the athletes or – I think I think in general, you know, what I've what I've found is, um, you know, you mentioned in, in, in my bio that, like, you know, I, I've been working with um, high performance athletes for, you know, over 10, over 10 years, just, um, you know, really, uh, because it was so much fun. I, I loved working with, um, you know, a lot of these guys were um, like NHL level hockey players, uh, you know, some football and track and field athletes that I worked with basketball as well. Um, and what I found, and, and actually I worked with some, you know, high performing executives and what I found over and over again is what people really loved was a program tailored to them. You know, obviously, um, certain principles, um, and, um, you know, practices, <coughs> excuse me, that were consistent with, uh, high performers being adapted to their individual needs like that really resonates with people. Um, I think, uh, when you look at a group of athletes training, um, you know, you see this kind of uh, desire initially for athletes. Well, if they're doing that much, I want to do that much too. Um, and, uh, you know, interestingly, you know, just to answer the question specifically, like what happens when you have these conversations with, with athletes at Altus, um, you know, Dan Paff had a group of jumpers, vaulters, multi-event folks, and, and there were some athletes that just were – you know, always inflamed, never recovering from training. And then as soon as they move out over to a taper or a rollover um, program that he refers to as a rollover program, which is basically a competitive um, program, uh, the athletes with, that were constantly inflamed and not recovering were all of a sudden performing insanely well um, because of the reduction in volume. And, and those athletes that um, didn't do well during the training season uh, had markers that um, would indicate uh, slower recovery and increased uh, risk to, to injury. Yeah, it's incredible, yeah. isn't it? I mean, the movement towards personalized nutrition, personalized training, personalized medicine. I mean, it's intuitively mm -hmm. it makes so much sense, but it's, it's amazing how the, sort of the revolution is now coming on with being able to do some of these things. And um, obviously what you mentioned there in terms of Dan being able to 
visualize this with athletes, et cetera. Now, with your work with the guys down at Altus, I mean, I know, uh, you know, the sprint gene, the actin three there, uh, is that, is that a, a, a real thing? Are we able to identify certain people or what does that tell us in athletes or even the average person who, uh, you know, is trying to stay fit, doing some CrossFit lifting, who, who, who notices they have this variant? Is it, uh, going to influence how they train? Sure. Um, I just one thing, Dr. Bubs, no, no person is average. At 3.8 billion years, you're here, you're awesome. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. To 100% agree. 100% agree. <laughs> that distinction. Uh, we, we put labels on ourselves or we accept labels from other people. I think anybody with a remarkable goal is cool and I want to work with that person. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, and actually, I can actually post this slide as well. Um, if we look at, say, for example, Actin 3, um, you know, we, uh, for, for folks that um, um, haven't read uh, David Epstein's The Sport Gene, uh, what we see in an actin-3 um, mutation in the, in the sprint gene is um, essentially this uh, absence of an alpha actin-3 expression, and then you get a compensatory overexpression of um, alpha actin-2. Um, and this has implication to like the Z-disc structure within the um, sarcomere contraction region um, within the muscle, changes leverage, changes how the muscle is fueled and the kinds of um, nutrients it uses. Um, but ultimately, you know, one of the things that we do see, um, and this is like coming from, you know, one of the original um, uh, um, white paper studies, actin-3 genotype is associated with human elite athletic performance. I mean, I'm actually reading verbatim um, the, uh, the title here, um, first author, um, Dr. Yang. Uh, but uh, I just even look at that title and I think of how irresponsible a title that is because um, what do we mean by elite athletic performance because we're talking about speed power generation right so you're looking at a sub population of athletes and maybe it's it is um, you know certainly overrepresented uh, in in some um, populations um, in particular sprinters I mean we, we know that to be true um, we do also see that um, actin genotype um, uh, and, and modulation of skeletal muscle response to exercise um, in some uh, human subjects. So, okay, fine, you, maybe you're, you're putting on more muscle mass, um, but what if I have that Achilles tendon predisposition to rupture? Um, you know, if I have bigger structures pulling on those weaker structures, is that actually increased performance? So we've got to look at it in a holistic uh, fashion and then if we talk about like talent identification, it's like, well, you know, just press pause for a second here um, because, you know, we've, we've found some world-class athletes that don't have the quote unquote sprint gene um, that have yep. been, as, as I said, Olympic level, like 200 meter athletes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not to say that, okay, well, could, could you take this information and, and, and move laterally? Like, um, you know, m maybe um, go up in the in the, in the four hundred or, but the point is that you know there are exceptions to the rule, and if you look at how any of these studies are done, you know, in the in the in the early days, you might you know classify a, a group of individuals and and um, you know find cases versus controls and do what's referred to as a genome wide association study, but you know effectively what you are finding is an overrepresentation, not something that's ubiquitous. Um, an overrepresentation of, say, sprinters would, would have, there would be an overrepresentation of the sprint gene variant. Um, but we don't want to extrapolate that um, to, to include uh, all people. I mean, uh, we see the mold broken time and time again. And I think that's why we love sport so much, um, is because it constantly proves us wrong in what we've thought were the limitations um, on human performance. For sure, 100% agree. So I guess the the uh, desk worker who finds the the best variant of that shouldn't just quit their job and uh, try to go for Olympic gold. I guess, right? Is, is more to the story. <laughs> I guess, I guess not necessarily. But I mean, I think people people get motivated in in different ways. I mean, let's not forget that. I mean, if you could say, hey, wow, you're really genetically similar to Usain Bolt. Like, I mean, if you got a sedentary person and that gets them off the couch, I mean, I think that that's kind of cool. Phenomenal. Absolutely. Totally agree. <laughs> You've got to manage people's expectations. I think that, um, 
you know, taking people's genetics based on where it is today and plugging it into an algorithm and saying, here's your optimal training plan. I think that's very short sighted. Um, For sure. Yeah. Now, the, the brain, obviously, is the sort of the new frontier in sport performance. Um, what can we tell from the genetic side of things that could influence in terms of, uh, you know, psyche, uh, in terms of sport and elite athletics? Yeah, th- this is this is an interesting one. Um, uh, again, uh, starting with the disclaimer that, uh, like you said, right, the, the um, um, genetics loads the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Um, there's, uh, you know, one one particular variant of the um, of the, and I'll post this as well, uh, of the, the the comp gene that actually um, is referred to in the literature as the warrior versus the worrier gene, um, and this has to do with uh, the rate of metabolism of, you know, various neurotransmitters um, and uh, you know, dopamine, for example. Um, what what's interesting is that you can kind of pick these people people out um, and I and I do time and time again like um, that kind of well you know that I describe that kind of border collie like behavior like in me when I take all that caffeine that tends to be like more of your worrier yep. um, I, we, we like the term strategist <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right but, but like in that individual they don't need very much stress to bring urgency um, to a situation and these are like the folks that like really like to practice, right? But they might buckle under pressure. Or, you know, this kind of personality might be overrepresented in a pitcher or a goalie. Um, not not universally, but um, definitely an overrepresentation. And, um, you know, how individuals, um, as I said, handle stress when they're in the warrior state, um, you know, they often need a whole heck of a lot of stress, like the stress of competition to get up for performance. So, you know, what do you do with that information? You know, and we just um, anecdotally at this point, we see things um, even like like athletes with these different genotypes already kind of figuring it out from themselves because a lot of these are very mature athletes um, and they've learned this through trial and error. But the folks that would tend to be more of a strategist, they listen to like more like classical music on race day, believe it or not, compared to like the warriors. They're like more kind of really bass, bass kind of, you know, get me pumped, let's go. Um I mean, I'm always amazed at uh, you know certain athletes when it's in terms of practice are able to perform at certain levels, and then when the games when it comes time to perform in games or big games, and things can change for some uh, in a negative way. And some athletes who you wouldn't expect to necessarily perform in those high pressure situations all of a sudden have more of that warrior mentality and come out off the bench and have you know, a big performance um, or in an event unexpectedly. So um, that's that's really interesting. Now you know, we've got one of our uh, old Canada basketball guys there, Dr. Jazz, is down there with Altus. Jazz, yeah, there you go, man. That's amazing. Uh-huh. You know what he did. You know what he did for me. Um, it, <laughs> this was insane. Um, so yesterday, yesterday, sorry, Saturday. Wow, all the days bleed together. Um, Saturday, I was in. I was like, um, you know, he just like looks at me. He's like, hey, you, you know, you want me to look, take a look at your foot, right? Because. Um, you know, I rolled my right ankle, and he can just see like it's 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 it, the flexion isn't there. There's no range of motion, and it's just just basically it's stuck in the ankle joint. And yeah, and he's like, you know, I want to use you as a as guinea pig to you know go through with my therapist and 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 walk them through and see if we can find that not not just treat the problem but find the the cause, right? What about like understanding the pathology and for sure. And, and, and so anyway, he goes through it and, and, um, you know, he, he walks through the anatomy and, and the approach with, uh, um, you know, some of the interns that he has here, but then he goes more so into like the neural, um, pathways and, um, you know, he just starts doing the, the QA decision tree type stuff and yeah. brought it back to discovering that I actually had a spondylolisthesis at L4 and, and he's like, okay, so what do we know about that nerve root? And, and so, you know, <laughs> Nice. So, so, so Jazz is like, you don't have a foot problem. I mean, you have a foot problem, but you don't have a foot problem, which, which was just nuts. Um, and then he's like, okay, no, the, the true diagnostic is, you know, get a um, get a cortisone shot, and um, or get an, get an epidural and find and, and and see if the, you know, because I got a little bit of pain in the Achilles. Um, tendon or the sheath actually yeah but anyway just just that process that he has and and that he's finding a way to scale it he, he just blew my mind blew my mind he's a pretty sharp dude man now 
coming out on the nutrigenomics front, you know, what are some things that have you, you know, excited in terms of some of the potential going forward here in the next few years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think just the the um, the fact that 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 people are <clears throat> starting to understand how how important this is, um, it, it is the first thing that's inciting, exciting. Um, you know, just to back up and, you know, to give your listeners context, it's like, well, you know, historically, um, we, if we look at, you know, human evolution, like we had these geographical, geological barriers that would exist and allow populations, uh, or I should say forced populations to, to you know, essentially evolve in, in concert with a closed ecosystem, if you will. Um, so if you have folks that, you know, are, are hailing from, say, um, you know, Central Africa, like milk was actually a water source. So if you didn't have lactase persistence and had explosive diarrhea, you weren't going to make it. Um, so <laughs> in some cases, like, hey, milk, okay, you're good. There's, I mean, maybe low levels of inflammation, but, you know, nothing to go crazy over. Um, I think the same things that we're seeing around, like, various food allergens like, you know, like um, gluten, for example, um, uh, you know, I think um, having people come to uh, understand that their genomes are like now cosmopolitan because, you know, we're mixing, we're, we're all moving around the planet. And so like some aspects of diversity um, are, are in us that we didn't, we didn't necessarily appreciate before. So, um, you know, I think getting to the heart of your individual requirements and and really, I think um, putting the the power into the the hands of the of the user um, is is the most exciting thing for me. And and what do I mean by that? Well, you know, we have built this entire education program as well that we've been, you know, testing um, uh, with coaches. You, you should get on it. You should you should join our next session. They're free, by the way. Awesome. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, I'll send that info as well. Um, so. Uh, you, you know the the idea that people are going to start to to take charge and and you know start to see things in their lives. Oh, okay, you know, yeah, I I, I do um, tend to take longer to acclimatize to higher altitude, and you know, I have uh, lower lower predisposition to say B12 or serum B12 levels or iron levels, and so I have to be more proactive about how I um, manage that nutrition uh, as a result because. Um, it's really like there's no magic silver bullet, but there's like a bunch of lead bullets. And I think if we show people how to, you know, to use your analogy again, um, understand what their gun is loaded with and what the triggers are, um, you're going to see people, I think, really engaged in understanding themselves. And um, I think in the longer term, you're going to be offsetting, you know, so in the short term, you know, definitely controlling for things like, you know, inflammation and recovery and leading to optimal performance in athletes. But in the longer term, I think this has huge implications um, in terms of managing um, individual needs, getting the precision nutrition, and preventing things like you know, uh, you know, chronic disease and, and inflammatory states that folks fall into into middle mid to late age. Yeah, absolutely love it. I mean, circling back to your comment about everyone being exceptional. I mean, I, you know, in my book, I mentioned sort of the inner everyone's inner athlete and that idea that yeah, we're all. It is exceptional that we're all here, and then the human body is, as you know, just phenomenal. And uh, of course, all these insights that we can get. I recently had Dr. Kate Shanahan on, and of course, she dives into the, the nutrition and how that impacts the genes. And so this whole story starts to kind of unfold in front of us. So it's pretty cool that you guys are on the leading edge of of, of what's coming out. Now, if we if we shift gears a little bit here, I want to respect your time for the day. Um, mm. Can you tell us you you you've, you've give us some little snippets there? But can you give us some insights into yourself? How do you start the day? You know, is coffee still part of the routine? Is it not? Yeah. How does that look like? Well, coffee's now like a it's like a secret weapon. You know, I don't I don't use caffeine so much, um, but uh, um, when I when I do, it it, it um, you know it definitely has has an impact um, as a result. But um, I, I think like the biggest thing um, that uh, that I need to introduce into my life is is some kind of um, constancy or consistency because there is a lot of you know a lot of travel a lot of hustle um, that goes into starting and, and building a company and you know I've got a great team um, so uh, that's that's really been something that's supported me over the years but um, you know certainly I, I I make it a point to to carve out anywhere from you know one to 
you know, three hours, one to four hours a day on weekdays, uh, whether it be mindfulness training or, or my, mindfulness meditation or training, or it's kind of more like as, as I feel um, type of training to really um, balance the, um, I think the professional workload um, that, that I have. And Saturday, I kind of reserve as a day to like, <laughs> just train until I don't need to anymore. Nice. <laughs> if that nice. makes, if that makes sense. So like I, you know, I like to wake up early and I just, just go and until I'm like, okay, you know, that that's enough. Um, but you know, typically if I, if I said, you know, go with a, like, well, like a day like today, um, you know, I'm up at five, uh, jumping in the cold tub at, uh, um, at six and I did a meditation series, uh, quick, um, you know, restorative yoga. And then I did a, VO2 max session and then I jumped back in the cold tub and rushed over to see you. Um, awesome. so that, yeah, that, that, that was today. And then, and then of course, like, you know, the, the nutritional side of things, like a, a big part of it is yes, like what you take. And I do optimize that <laughs> based on what I know about, you know, my, my genetics. Um, but it's also timing. Um, so I, I, um, implement like a, a variation of intermittent fasting, um, but a lot of like majority of my meals, like, like my highly higher caloric, um, in, um, intake is going to be post exercise. I really like this notion of you hunt and then you eat. Um, nice. I, pretty, it's a pretty simple one. Um, and, uh, and then I, I tend to modulate, uh, carbohydrates through the day where, you know, I'll actually, um, as I said, uh, have, have more of those starchy foods like after my training to, to, really serve more as a glycogen um restoration and replenishment so um yeah that's that's um that's my training throughout the day and then you know um my days consist of um you know a lot of work and in, in hammering out um uh, the execution of the vision with my awesome team um like monday is like usually a big alignment day and then you know uh, something that i i do as well uh, and I learned this just doing a time management exercise, um, is I actually pair tasks or I try to do tasks back to back that are most similar because we know task changing takes time and, and, and really sucks into your um, effectiveness, I think. So For sure. For sure. if I'm doing like kind of like deep thinking um, work, I'm, I'm not going to hop on a podcast after that because I'll just, <laughs> I'll be too, a little bit Plays too much. Over. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, and then on the other hand, it's like after this podcast, I'm not gonna, you know, hop on the the, the, the uh, in with the team and, and go through product specs um, because my mind will be too expanded. Um, so that that's a really important trick that is analogous to training, right? right? Like you don't go and get a uh, relaxing deep tissue massage and then hop under the squat rack and try to move 500 pounds, right? So um, uh, athletes uh, turned uh, entrepreneurs will appreciate that analogy. Hundred percent. I mean, it's amazing how that just sort of brings it to life, doesn't it? Where we're doing all these things in our day, we don't realize how um, conflicting they are. And then when you use an analogy like that, it's like, geez, obviously that that, does, that makes total sense. Um, yeah. Now let's wrap things up here. Just that thirty thousand foot view. If you can answer a question for us, why do you do what you do? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I um, why your why? I mean, the, the why is so important, right? Like I. Uh, I think I alluded to this um, before. Like it, it really is a simple answer, um, and you know it's for mom. Why do I do this? It's for mom, and um, you know it's for any you know kid that wanted to like um, you know help their mom or help somebody uh, get better um, through the um, you know sharing of information and collaboration. Uh, that's 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 my big why. Um, and, um, you know, I think the other one is because, because I can, I mean, this is like a very, uh, as I said, ac accidental, I'm not going to pretend I, I was so strategic in planning my life this way, but, um, you know, I, I just kind of, uh, fell into these two fields like human performance and, um, and genetics. And, and, um, I, I think that, um, I'm in a position to help, uh, a lot of people by mobilizing a team around this vision and um, you know we're already seeing the the effects of that uh, I mean I'll just share you know one example is um, you know so uh, I mentioned things that didn't end so well for my, my mom but um, you know my sister for example she 
um, was running into this issue with, um, you know, psoriasis. Um, and, uh, you know, she's having all these lesions all over her face. She, you know, you know what's going on. And I was like, well, you know what, we're, we're going to be, um, you know, working with this company that's, that's, um, you know, trying to, to solve for that problem for, you know, um, psoriasis uh, medication. Let me, let me see if I can get some information, see if I can get you into the pilot. And, um, uh, anyway, I called, I called, uh, John and, and, um, said, Hey, you know, can we get my sister into this study? Cause we're going to be looking at blood and DNA and, um, you know, response to different, um, treatments and, and what are the triggers that are leading to this, um, inflammatory response. And he said, yeah, yeah, of course she can come in the study, but, um, you know, tell me more about her condition. I'm like, well, you know, she had a baby and, um, you know, she's, uh, having flare ups like never before I had them. when she was a kid, I remember, but never like this. Uh, she can't get any answers, getting her blood work done. Nobody's giving her any insights. And he's like, okay, well, here's what you can do. First things first, like here's a topical solution that's safe for the baby. And secondly, the issue is that when she's pregnant, she's accumulating more brown fat. And, you know, that's more of your uh, adaptive immune system. So like antimicrobials that are enriched there um, that uh, give the innate immune system a break. And um, when the baby, you know, when, when my sister started to breastfeed, of course, the brown fat goes away and then her innate immune system gets bombarded and it's just like, you know, going into overdrive. Sure. Sure. So then, you know, I call back my sister and I'm like, hey, here's what's going on. And it's just like, you know, tears of like confusion and, and despair, like to, wow, okay, cool. Like I have the answer. And like to be able to do that for everybody, I mean, I think everybody has a problem, like a health problem like that or a performance problem like that. And this is really about putting a tool in their hands and connecting them to a community to solve for that. Um, and and uh, that's really what it, it excites me. Like it excites me to hear like stories from like a guy I was talking to um, just this morning, uh, a Canadian triathlete who um, I did some work with a few years ago and gave him some insights. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, by the way, I took like 32 minutes off my Ironman because of the insights that you gave wow. me. And I was just like, whoa, like what did I say? And it really – what like I don't see it as anything – there's nothing big, you know, there's no one big thing, but I think, you know, we get people to start looking internally at how awesome they are, how powerful they are, and to start coaching other people and sharing. Uh, I mean, like we talked about this, this resource of nutrigenomics being like, oh, this is like a really, you know, cool area. And it's just like, it's, it's going to become so much more cool. And people, you know, start understanding, as I said, their own technology, 3.8 billion years in the making. And, um, you know, that's when we're going to really accelerate um, innovation. I think it's a it's a global collaboration that that we're working towards, and I don't know. But for me, it's like how could I not do that? That's, um, that's but, fantastic, but, man. Well, it's inspiring but, stuff, and it's inspiring to listen. You know, hearing you speak, and you know, where can people learn more about Athletogen? Keep up with your work and connect with uh, you know your team on social media. Yeah, um, Athletogen dot com is uh, is where we're at, and I think. You know, just for your listeners being the um, professional crowd, uh, um, you know, we'll definitely follow up with um, the, the education resources that we that we have. Um, Heather is, is a uh, actually former pole vaulter, uh, RBC Olympian. I stole her from Altas, and I'm not even feeling bad about it. <laughs> She's our, our, our head of um, strategic partnerships, and, and she's working on a really cool um, affiliate program, too. So um, I'll, I'll get her contact out there for you guys as well. So it's an exciting time, and 